Hello, everyone. Welcome after the networking and sessions break. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And welcome to our next keynote session with Professor Kyle Cranmer from uh, New York University. Uh, let me introduce our speaker. Kyle Kramer is a professor of physics and data science at New York University and the executive director of the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment at New York University. Uh, his background is in experimental particle physics. Uh, he obtained his PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2005. He was also awarded multiple awards. Mm, such as Presidential Early Career Award. Mm, he uh, developed a framework that enables collaborative statistical modeling, uh, which was used extensively uh, for the discovery of the Higgs boson in July 2012. His current interests are at the intersection of physics and machine learning. Uh, today, we welcome the professor with the lecture uh, some fun examples from the intersection of machine learning and physics. Thank you for joining us, Professor, and the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's, uh, it's a yeah, pleasure to uh, talk to you. It seems like a really interesting group. Um, I have, uh, from my work in particle physics, several colleagues from uh, Poland and uh, been able to visit several times. I wish I could be there in person to talk with you, but uh, here we are. So, um, so you see the title. Um, I chose. I tried to choose some kind of fun topics because, uh, well, it's been sort of a tough year with uh, with uh, the coronavirus, and I think everyone is a little bit tired. Um, so, so I'm going to try to make this uh, lecture be, uh, you know, interesting and engaging, but also sort of entertaining. Um, um, so this is uh, work I kind of. Uh, picked and choose some uh, examples uh, from uh, collaborations with many different people. So uh, on this screen, you see collaborators that I'm working with, some of which are uh, physicists, some are machine learning researchers, some are uh, applied mathematicians. And uh, in the last few years, I've had a lot of fun with this type of uh, 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 interdisciplinary research uh, with, uh, uh, between you know, physics and machine learning and AI. Um, and we just had a, a workshop um, last week at, uh, at NeurIPS that was titled Machine Learning for the Physical Sciences. And uh, there were many, uh, you know, very interesting papers uh, submitted there and nice talks. So I, you know, invite you to go uh, look at the website there and, and, and check out some of the talks if, if you find this interesting. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today really was um, a kind of a, a combination of three, three different themes. So uh, on one side, I'm thinking about very popular uh, topics in machine learning that you see um, uh, from, say, deep learning. So one of those are deep generative models like GANs and variational autoencoders and normalizing flows and things like that. Um, the other has to do with the graph networks uh, and, and this idea of geometric deep learning and these kinds of ideas. So I want to uh, talk about these areas and in, 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 uh, sort of deep learning and then also bring in issues that are kind of more foundational questions about uh, artificial intelligence and the kinds of models that we use. Um, so in particular, the role of inductive bias um, and uh, you know, sort of the choice of the architecture you use and how that influences what's going on. And these uh, sort of new ideas about bringing in uh, concepts of causality uh, into uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, and then at the bottom, I would also like to bring in the sort of science direction, and most of the examples I have will be kind of from physics or chemistry. Um, and uh, and so bringing these uh, these ideas together, I think is you know is you know there are a lot of interesting research questions, and I'm and I hope that will advance uh, you know our understanding of and and you know techniques for artificial intelligence. So first, I'm just going to start with some things that I I hope are you know look familiar. So. When I'm talking about uh, uh, deep generative models, I'm thinking about uh, architectures like generative adversarial networks or GANs that are able to produce these very high uh, resolution images. These, these uh, are examples of people. They're not real people, uh, but the, uh, this, this GAN was trained by, for instance, looking at uh, many pictures of uh, celebrities 
and, and essentially tried to learn a distribution over images of what celebrities look like. And once you learn that distribution, then you can sample from that distribution. And here are two samples, and uh, and you get these very uh, you know very impressive looking images. And so this is a you know it's been a few years now that uh, this kind of capability came into deep learning, uh, and it's very impressive. Uh, it's you know certainly a hot topic, and you can imagine that uh, for scientists uh, this kind of capability could be very interesting. Maybe this we can take advantage of this for science, um, but we can also try to kind of put the two together to understand uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, better. Um, so another example that's not with images is with audio. So I'll play a, a audio clip here. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. So this is just like the image was very high fidelity and looked very realistic. This audio clip sounds very realistic, and it was generated from a slightly different type of deep generative model um, that uses a, a, a an auto regressive structure like this, and you see this sort of play out of how the how the network generates uh, each uh, time, you know, sample uh, one after another, um, and uh, these these approaches, you know, they again very impressive um, uh, and interesting, you know, work that's going on. Um, another type of deep generative model that uh, you may or may not be familiar with are what are called normalizing flows. Uh, again, they're trying to model a very complicated distribution that might be in a very high dimensional space. So you can imagine that if X is the observation, like your image or your audio or whatever your data happens to be, you're trying to model some complicated distribution, Q of X. Um, and the way that you model that uh, complicated distribution is by starting with a very simple distribution like a Gaussian um, and then running it through a neural network, similar to what you do with a, a GAN. Uh, the only difference is that the, the dimensionality of this original Gaussian random variable needs to be the same as the dimensionality of this uh, of your data, and this function needs to be invertible. And if this is invertible, then the uh, distribution on this side is given by this change of variables formula. And so you just need to calculate essentially the Jacobian transformation of this, of this function. Um, and this function, oftentimes, the way you build it is by starting with a very simple uh, invertible transformation and then composing several of them together to make something more complicated. So this idea of normalizing flows is is, uh, is very nice and is starting to be used quite a bit in, in science and I'll show some examples. And one of the things that's important about normalizing flows and uh, this uh, kind of approach that I talked about before is that uh, you can actually calculate the likelihood for one of your uh, data observations yeah, um, while in something like a generative adversarial network, that's not possible. Okay, so that's kind of just uh, some you know recap about uh, deep generative models. It's interesting, um, and just to kind of point out that this there was a whole workshop at uh, at uh, um, at uh, ICML uh, this this year that was focused on this, and there there had been some more before. So this is a you know fairly large topic uh, in uh, in machine learning. So the next uh, thing that I'd like to bring into the discussion now is the role of inductive bias. Um, and so by inductive bias, I'm talking about the choice of the architecture and, and how that influences the performance. So one example uh, that's, that's very well known is that when you're dealing with image data, you might think that, okay, the picture of the sunflower is the same, you know, if it's here or if it's slightly shifted. And so you think about the, the label associated to this image being a sunflower is, is sort of invariant to translating the picture. Um, inside of the network uh, you, with these convolutional filters, you would say that if you shift over the image that the response inside of the network is the word equivariant instead of invariant, but it's the same kind of idea that there's a symmetry involved. Um, and also the idea that you know the picture is made up of sort of low-level features and mid-level features and high-level features sort of reflects this picture that the world is compositional. Um, and so that leads to this hierarchical architecture. And, and these two ideas in, in uh, the convolutional neural networks is a lot of why you know, convolutional neural networks work so well on images. Um, <clears throat> there's now an abstraction of this idea to things that are not like regular grids, but you know, have data that you know, has some kind of you know, more, uh, a different type of structure and, and a, a kind of general way of thinking about it is that the data lives on a graph. Um, and so this image here is sort of showing that the, the data points, you have nodes and you have edges between them, 
Um, and you can generalize the ideas of convolutions and things on graph structured data. Um, and there's this whole emerging area of what's called geometric deep learning for dealing with this type of structured data. And it's also very useful for like social networks and things like that. Um, and again, uh, at, uh, at ICML, there was a workshop focused on, on sort of graph representation learning and, and this type of uh, inductive bias. Um, the the other big idea that's of, of you know coming around in terms of uh, you know uh, you know changing the thinking about uh, you know AI and machine learning is this idea of uh, ca causality and that and the you know the the well known statement that correlation is not causation. Um, so this is a, a a nice book by Judea Pearl called the Book of Why, um, which talks about sort of different levels of abstraction of of thinking and reasoning. And uh, the lowest level in this ladder is called association. And that's what basically when you know about some uh, statistical dependence between two variables. So, um, so for instance, a lot of machine learning, you, you give it a, an observation X and a target Y, and you're trying to learn uh, you know, how to predict the target Y, <clears throat> that most of that type of supervised learning is really at this level of association. So it's kind of the lowest rung on the ladder. While the next rungs in this in this ladder uh, are the idea of being able to do an intervention to be able to add, ask a question about uh, what would happen if I do you know if I do something so for instance if I take some medicine will my headache go away um, and then there's even a higher level uh, of question which has to do with uh, what are called counterfactuals so being able to ask a question uh, of like what if I had done something different. Um, and so these kinds of answering these kinds of questions are really important for uh, making progress in artificial intelligence. Um, and here's an example in case this isn't familiar. Here are three different uh, simple programs. Uh, and when you run them, they give you a value of X and Y. And here's the scatter plot of, of X and Y. And you see that in, in each of these cases, the, uh, the, the joint distribution of X and Y is exactly the same. So from the point of view of association, uh, it's exactly the, you know, these are all identical. Um, and if you took, for instance, you know, ask the conditional distribution of Y given X, it's the same in each case. But there's this idea of intervening. What if I went in and I set the variable uh, X to be three inside of this uh, program, which you can think of as, you know, kind of a simulation for whatever is really going on in your system. And so in the way that you make an intervention here is you basically just change the code and you set uh, x equal to three uh, every time, uh, you know, every step along the way, you, you intervene and say, no, x is three, even if you don't think it should be three. Um, and when you do that, uh, then you look at the scatter plot and, you know, you see, okay, x is three in each of them, but the conditional distribution of y uh, looks different now. And that's uh, part of the reason that there's this difference when you're talking about causality uh, between just simply conditioning and intervening. So this is this is what's called the do operation when you come in and you intervene and you set uh, uh, x equal to three. And so the way that the distributions respond is different and you can actually tell, uh, tell apart these three different causal models uh, through uh, making these kinds of interventions. Now, um, here's a slide that uh, Yashua Bingio showed and some uh, uh, excerpts from some discussion, public discussion on Facebook, uh, that's basically saying that you know, well, you know, when we're making our our machine learning models, you know, uh, what if we actually our machine learning model has the right causal structure? It knows about you know, uh, uh, you know, what random variables caused what other random variables to happen. Uh, the and and so he has this claim that uh, under the hypothesis that you know the different uh, sort of causal mechanisms are are relative are independent that if you get the right causal structure that it will you know require less data to train um, you'll be it will be easier to recover from uh, a change of distributions uh, so this this idea of domain adaptation or to be able to help with transfer learning uh, these kinds of things and so uh, if you could do this, this these are all like you know important topics for artificial intelligence and so this is you know why people are taking causality so seriously um, and here are just again some other uh, you know talks by, for instance, Leon Bateau, and uh, and a paper on the same topic about uh, sort of changing an entire you know paradigm of machine learning, say from instead of empirical risk minimization to this idea of uh, excuse me invariant risk minimization, which again is like uh, really trying to leverage the the causal structure and these these ideas of causality. 
Okay, so those that all of that is just some preamble about uh, these are you know topics that are you know kind of current topics and the thinking about machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence. So now the question is like, where does physics and science fit into this discussion? Um, so here's a slide from uh, Stefan Mala, who's well known for his work in wavelets and things like this. And, um, and so he was talking about this kind of connection between machine learning and physics. And uh, you know, one is he was pointing out some, some of the common mathematical connections between what's going on in physics and machine learning. Uh, and, and you know, two of the things he highlighted here uh, are, for instance, uh, trying to find symmetries and, ex and separating phenomena that happen at different scales. And so this is very much related to the success that you see, for instance, in convolutional neural networks with uh, the idea that as you shift the, the image around, uh, that, uh, that the, the label should be invariant, that's the symmetry that's involved, and that you're separating phenomena at different scales, which is essentially the pooling operation of a convolutional neural network that's giving you uh, small scale features and large scale features. Um, but there are many other kinds of inductive bias that are out there that are you know, becoming very important. So Peter Battilia, who's, who's doing work uh, with graph neural networks, uh, his background is actually from uh, you know, cognitive science. And he has this, uh, this slide that I like a lot of talking about the message from human cognition. And he's saying that when you want to make uh, richly structured models about different objects and the relationships, uh, that that's you know that this is a you know thinking about the objects and the relationships is a powerful tool for for like building these models, um, and that uh, and that uh, you have this idea of combinatorial generalization of being able to take those basic components and 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 combine them in different ways, and there's this phrase of sort of the infinite use of finite means, meaning you have a you know, fairly small set of building blocks and you can combine them in, in various different ways. And this is a, a useful tool for model building, okay, which is a, one of the, the a quote uh, uh, attributed to Josh Tenenbaum. Now, so if I think about inductive bias now, we have these ideas of compositionality and symmetry. We have the idea of relationships between different uh, objects scale separation and causality. So all of these are, these are you know, uh, an exhaustive list of all the different types of inductive bias, but they're all important forms of inductive bias. And all of these are like very uh, important. And, and when we do science, when you think about you know, how scientists and physicists have come to understand the world, these have all been really important concepts. Um, and you see them uh, reflected in deep learning and you see you know, evidence of their success, but some of these are relatively new. So some of these ideas are relatively new. And so I wanted to highlight some examples where you see success. Um, <clears throat> the other place where science uh, comes into the story is that uh, science is full of all sorts of simulators. We have simulators to describe what's going on in collisions and particle colliders how molecules uh, you know, move and, and proteins fold, how neurons you know, activate, how epidemics spread, uh, how you know, images of black holes, images of uh, light bending around uh, galaxies because of uh, 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 general relativity and the, the evolution of the universe. We have simulators on all these different scales and all of these simulators they uh, they don't just describe some distribution of the data. They describe what's happening inside. So they are they're not only generative models of the data. They're causal models uh, for the causal generative models for the data. And so uh, if we want to understand more about causality, um, it makes a lot of sense to try to apply you know machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to problems in the physical sciences where we actually have a causal mechanism and we can try to understand what's going on so uh so for one thing we can generate a lot of uh synthetic data from them uh and so we so we can do experiments uh with uh machine learning to see how well they work and in these uh simulated data sets we usually have ground truth so it's very good for uh, for doing research to be able to basically check how well these systems are working. If you apply that to a system where you really have no idea what's going on, it's much harder and you don't have ground truth, it's much harder to tell if the machine learning algorithms are working. Um, the other thing that I think is really important here is that when you, in each of these cases, we know what the simulator is doing. Um, so we have some insight about the data generating process, the underlying causal mechanism. And so that informs various kinds of inductive bias on a machine learning architecture. And then so we can look to see, you know, if, if, we, if we try to 
uh, mirror the same, you know, the, the architecture, we try to mirror the data generating process, does that help? And we can start to test this hypothesis that Yashua Bengio was mentioning. So now I'm gonna switch to some kind of fun examples. Um, and I'll just basically show these, you know, as many of these examples as I can until I <laughs> run out of time, essentially. Um, and I hope they're, you know, kind of entertaining, but there's a there's a there's an arc of a story along the way. So um, so let's talk about this issue of uh, the insight of the data generating process informs inductive bias on their architecture. So one of the types of architectures that's around right now are, is have to do with these graph neural networks. Okay, so here uh, the, in the graph neural network, you have uh, nodes and edges, um, and uh, there might also be coupling to some sort of global en environment or something like that. And so in these examples, if you're thinking about like, uh, you know, balls that are like interacting, say, through gravity or springs or, or balls bouncing around and hitting a wall or like a string or a chain. Um, you can, so I have uh, videos of these things. Um, here are some examples of, you know, this physical system. The top is, uh, the top row is coming from an actual simulation of what would go up, you know, what would be happening. And then you can train a graph neural network uh, where what's interesting here is that the the different nodes and edges, they all kind of mean something. They, they, they map onto the, uh, the sort of underlying physics, um, but they don't know the specific physics. So you have like the edge represents a force, but it doesn't know what the force is. So there's still, it's still a deep learning model. It still has to learn what's going on. What are the important properties of the nodes? What are the important properties of the edges? You know, do they interact with some, you know, global environment? Um, and these, these kinds of things you still have to figure out. Uh, but uh, but it has kind of the right scaffolding, you know. To and so here you see examples of once you've trained uh, these these uh, networks on uh, on on uh, on some simulated data, then you can take a new system and try to have it predict how the system is going to evolve evolve in time. And so here this is like a thousand time steps, um, and you see that uh, you know that it matches quite well, right? Um, sometimes uh, you'll see some you know, difference between like, if you follow the red ball, it starts to be different than the, you know, in the, in the prediction than in the ground truth, but this is a somewhat chaotic system. So you don't really expect the balls to move exactly along, but the, the point is that it's certainly a very, uh, you know, realistic kind of rollout that you might, might have. Um, now, what's also interesting about this is that once you've trained the model, you can apply it to a system that you've that was, was a totally different system. So in this example, you have a different number of balls or you know objects involved, and the, the chain has more links in it. Um, and so you're able to transfer this model to a different system without any, any learning going on. So this is zero shot generalization, and you see it still works quite well. And so the reason that you know this works is be basically because the primitives that the model was built on are are kind of universal and transferable. Um, so <clears throat> that was work by uh, by Peter and company. Um, I sort of joined that team and we did a, a little bit of uh, some extensions to this, and we tried to incorporate two more different types of physically motivated uh, inductive biases. So one is we thought, okay, well, what if <clears throat> Um, you know, we actually incorporate uh, um, ordinary differential equations and the fact that we know that underlying this physical system, there should be some sort of Hamiltonian uh, and that there, we know that Hamiltonian mechanics is, is, you know, should describe the system. So if you think that this is the real world, uh, that you have some data where the underlying physics is evolving the, uh, the state at some time step, you know, here labeled n to the next time step n plus one, you know, this evolution is being done by the real world physical simulator. Um, and so that's the kind of top row here. Um, so the original graph network that they that they worked on that I was showing you videos of basically takes the state, represents it as a graph, and then the graph neural network tries to predict essentially the delta, you know, the, the change from its current position, uh, at, you know, and momentum to uh, the next time steps position and momentum. And so that's what's happening here. You're just directly predicting what uh, the, the time the step should be. And that works pretty well. Um, so the idea here is that we're not going to just try to predict exactly the, the time step. We're going to uh, use a numerical integrator to try to evolve the system 
And, uh, and that numerical integrator needs another piece of input, which is essentially the dynamic of the system. So you have this function f, um, and what it's going to try to do is you're going to give it as input the current state of the system, and it's going to try to predict uh, the kind of time derivative of the position and momentum. So, um, but that's kind of a, it's more of a continuous idea as opposed to like a discrete time step. And so once you have this prediction, then you can give it to an integrator and it will try to just evolve the system in time. And then your, your goal is going to be actually to learn these dynamics. So the graph neural network is going to try to learn these dynamics. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the, a variation of this is that you can say, well, the, in this physical system, I don't know, it's not just any kind of, uh, you know, arbitrary dynamics. I know that underlying it, there's like the, the idea of, a, of an energy function called the, the Hamiltonian. And the, the way that the, the time derivatives, like uh, the position and the momentum should evolve in time is given by uh, the, the partial derivatives of a singer, single scalar function. That single scalar function of the state is called the Hamiltonian. And so, uh, so this is like a special case. Um, and so maybe I can try to uh, boil all of, the, all of the information of the system into a single scalar quantity that's a Hamiltonian and then uh, back propagate through that Hamiltonian to get these derivatives and then have the, the time evolution. So here we go. Um, this is the ground truth on the left. Um, we're gonna focus on this blue ball right here. Um, and then follow how it evolves in time. Um, this, is, this is going to be the rollout for that one, one ball as a function of time with the true underlying dynamics. This is the, the first model, this delta graph network. This is using a, a, a differential equation like a, a approach, but the neural network is trying to learn the dynamics. And here we're forcing it to go through this bottleneck where the, the, the entire hidden state is boiled down to a single a real valued scalar um, and uh, and the, called the Hamiltonian. And so watch the rollout of all of these. At first, they're all gonna look good and then you'll start to see them diverging as a function of time. So here it goes. You see them, uh, they all, it's amazing that this works as well as it does in each case, but you start to see the Delta graph network uh, diverging here. Then the, the ordinary differential equation approach starts to diverge a little bit and the Hamiltonian based neural network um, that's actually having to learn the Hamiltonian continues to be accurate even after you know after, you know many thousand time steps. So this is pretty impressive and, and kind of an interesting uh, interesting story. The other thing about this approach is that it generalizes to other types of integrators and other types of time steps, um, and so you've really somehow captured the underlying physics. Um, so this is just a fun example showing the sort of state of the art in this direction. This is much larger, like these. The, this last example, you know, you have I don't know, sort of ten objects. Uh, this is moving to a system where there are you know thousands and thousands of objects. And you, uh, on the left, you see the ground truth, and on the right, you see the prediction, and it's being rendered uh, to look like water, you know, uh, falling. And you just see these like really incredible predictions of what's going on. So um, this this work of using graph networks to try to learn the underlying uh, physics of some system. Uh, where there's a, a simulator and some causal mechanism and you're transferring it onto, onto some sort of uh, a machine learning model is like, you know, it's very impressive. So these are just very fun to watch this kind of, uh, <clears throat> these kinds of animations. Okay, so the next uh, uh, part of the story that I'll tell is, um, okay, when we think about uh, doing science, you know, you, there is a, for a lot of scientists, there is, they're used to thinking about the underlying laws being written down by some simple equations. And there's a, you know, maybe that's not uh, always the case. Maybe the, the underlying, you know, uh, reality is just actually a bit complicated. But in cases where it is simple, you know, you could ask, is there a way that we could somehow extract and get back to those simple laws? So one thing that we did, this was some work together with uh, Miles Cranmer, uh, we're not, not related, same last name, but not related. Um, is we had some physical system and we used a graph neural network and then we tried to extract the underlying uh, uh, equations that describe the, the force laws and things like that. <clears throat> so we considered it several different, these are different force laws um, and we let the system evolve with time using just a normal kind of Newtonian you know, time evolution and you see the different kinds of patterns that you get. So this was essentially the training data. Um, and then we trained a graph neural network 
Um, and but what we did here is that the messages that were being sent along the uh, the edges of the graph, which represent essentially the forces, we put uh, an an L1 regularization to try to make the messages be as sparse as possible. Um, and then and then once we had a sparse representation of that message. Um, then we tried to use symbolic uh, regression approaches, like a, a tool called Eureka. Uh, Miles is now working on something, uh, an open source version called uh, Pi SR for you know Python symbolic regression, um, and uh, and so that basically goes through a tree of different possible equations and uh, some sort of evolutionary approach, and then searches for a, a, an equation that describes the messages on the graph itself. Um, and so here, this is a, you know the function that was learned, and this turns out to just be a rotation of the underlying known force law for, in this example, just a, a springs you know springs between the objects. So this is pretty cool that we can actually extract the underlying uh, you know you know equations that describe the system. Um, and it's, it's what's interesting is that you know the, if you tried to apply symbolic regression directly to the raw data, you would have a very hard time. But because we uh, sort of moved from the raw data onto this graph neural network uh, that had the right kind of uh, you know component, it was org it sort of organized the information in the right way in terms of objects and forces. We were able to do this uh, symbolic regression, and so then we move to a situation where we don't actually know the ground truth, and that has to do with a, a system of, of dark matter. So the, here, this red stuff. Is from a very expensive computer simulation of dark matter in the universe uh, clumping gravitationally, and so you uh, so the 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 graph here is basically following these like clumps of dark matter in a in a simulation of the early universe, and what we would like to be able to predict is uh, you know if we go to some spot in the universe, can we ask if they expect there to be kind of more or less dark matter than on average? So that's what's called the over density of dark matter. Uh, just by looking at the kind of local neighborhood. And so um, so we trained that on a very big uh, graph. So it had uh, 215,000 dark matter uh, uh, halos, these clumps of dark matter. Um, and you know it's funny to think of the the edge between uh, you know two of these things has some physical meaning. It's you know it's a distance. and the distance here is 150 million light years. So it's a very large scale graph. Um, and the graph had, you know, whatever, 30 million uh, directional edges on it. So, uh, so we did machine learning on this enormous graph, and uh, and we were able to come up with a an equation that would, you know, after running symbolic regression, that would predict uh, the dark matter over density in a certain location. It has a very simple looking form. And what's interesting here is that, you know, we didn't really know what the sort of, uh, you know. We don't know what the right answer is, so then we can just say, okay, well, how well does this equation perform? Um, and what what one thing that was interesting is this equation ends up generalizing better than the uh, than the neural network itself. So even though this equation was extracted from a graph neural network, if you actually use the graph neural network directly, um, the equation generalizes better, which is kind of interesting. And it also generalizes better than uh, human produced uh, heuristics that had appeared in the literature before to try to uh, estimate what the dark matter over density would be by looking at the neighbors. So this was this was pretty cool, pretty cool work, I think. Um, so if I step back and think about, okay, well, why is this working? You know, a lot of the reason for the success of this approach is tied to the fact that the architecture, you know, the nodes and the edges, they mean something, right? They they're they kind of map directly onto, I would say, like the ontology and the semantics of some underlying physical system. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of debate about interpretability in machine learning, and you know, is it important or not? And in some in some cases, I think it's there's not an obvious argument for why interpretability is like so important. Um, and it's also not really clear what people even mean by interpretability. You know, if you have a really complicated linear model, is that interpretable? Um, I, I wouldn't consider that interpretable. Uh, but here there's like a very kind of specific sense of what we mean by interpretable, which is essentially do the neural do the neural network or the model architect you know architectural components map on to things that you know that are in my ontology as a as a scientist. Um, so that's a specific sense of interpretable. And another actionable sense in which it's interpretable is that I know how to take these components and mix them into a new model. 
uh, right? So they're transferable into a different situ situation, which is you know what what allowed this this system to work and have zero shot generalization. So this notion of interpretable is very important for you know for science. And so this is a kind of a Wikipedia level image of like the scientific method where you see, you know, you sort of, you make observations, you think about questions, you formulate a hypothesis, you develop some testable predictions, then you actually do an experiment, gather data, test the predictions. Uh, you know, you sit in some loop here, and then, you know, larger there is a kind of, then you try to develop more general theories and this whole thing sort of, you know, the scientific method evolves, right? And so this is maybe a little bit of a cartoon version of what's going on with this scientific method, but, uh, but you do see things here, like you know the importance of causality appears. Um, but this the the other thing that's really important is that when we think about what's going on in machine learning and AI, uh, AI is not very good at uh, formula, you know, hypothesis generation right now, right? Like uh, um, if you have a if you have a bunch of data and you want to extract some statistical relationship, uh, machine learning is very good. Um, and so it's used, for instance, you know, oftentimes in this. Uh, 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 this step here where you're trying to actually, you know, test a hypothesis, you know, or I guess here, you know, test this hypothesis. But in terms of formulating new hypothesis, hypotheses, machine learning and AI is still very early on. And so I think these kinds of approaches where the where you can understand the pieces and remix them is going to be very important for sort of making progress uh, for an AI and certainly in terms of making progress for, for AI when applied to the sciences. Um, so yeah, so if I here I'm just saying, imagine trying to do something like this if you were just using a big, dense feed-forward multi-layer perceptron. You would have no idea where to point to the information that is that corresponds to like a force or an object or the you know the properties of an object or something like that. Okay, so the next example I, I have actually comes from the Large Hadron Collider. So this is the picture of the Atlas detector that I that I work on. This is the size of a building, you know, uh, it's a huge uh, detector. And so this, this image is a computer visualization of an actual collision uh, that, that happened. Um, and so you would have a beam of particles coming from this side, another beam of particles coming from this side. They collide right here, and then they produce a bunch of other particles that come flying out into our detector. And so the, you, one thing you see is that the data doesn't look like a nice image. It's, a, it's very... You know the the raw data is is highly structured and has all sorts of you know unusual features in it, um, and uh, and you, it's also very sparse. You know most of the data is kind of just sitting in certain areas uh, in the detector, um, and so th this kind of uh, this kind of spray of particles is called a jet. And trying to understand this is you know a, an important task at the at the Large Hadron Collider, um, and uh, and so the without going into the underlying physics too much, I'll just say that we have a model that describes how, you know, uh, that how such a, you know, an observation like this, you know, comes to comes to be. Um, and so it starts off with like the interaction of very fundamental particles like quarks and gluons. And that's what these, these red uh, lines are. This is called a Feynman diagram. So this shows like the scattering of the very fundamental particles inside, you know, well inside of the nucleus of an atom. Uh, and this is something that you can write down on a pencil and paper, the, the probability uh, that, that this diagram is, is encoding the probability that the particles scatter in a particular way. Um, but that's not the end of the story. The, the particles additionally radiate a bunch of other things, and then they cluster together, and they and then these, these other particles come flying out into, the, into our detector. And the important part is that um, you know, this is the physicist model for uh, the generative model, the causal generative model for how the, the jet uh, comes to be. Um, but most of this stuff that's, you know, colored here, this is all, these are all latent variables. We don't actually observe this in the detector because all of this happens within like the nucleus of an atom. It's an incredibly short uh, distance scale. And so only these dark green blobs, these are the physical particles come flying out into, into our detector. So th that's these lines that we see um, that's, you know, the, the, those are the green blobs. So that's what we see. And so when we're trying to understand what's going on, you know, we could just work at the level of, of, of what we see here, or we could try to leverage uh, what we know about the underlying, you know, causal mechanism that produced it. Um, and so, uh, so here is a neural network uh, uh, architecture that we put together a few years ago that has a tree-like structure, and the leaves of this neural network are the, are the particles that 
hit the detector and all of the the, the intermediate you know uh, branches of this neural network are all hidden states of a of a recursive neural network or a tree tree RNN. Um, and so the, the data comes in at the leaves and propagates through the, the network and comes up to the top. And then you, in this case, we were just doing a classification problem. So we, were, we just wanted to do a classification decision. And uh, the point here is that the, the architecture is not fixed. Every single jet that we, uh, that we give to this uh, uh, system, we, we first run an, uh, an algorithm from our domain that tries to estimate uh, what do we think, you know, this, this, uh, what do we think happened? We tries to estimate or, you know, reconstruct this kind of tree-like structure. Um, and so we run that uh, algorithm and that gives us an architecture for that particular um, uh, observation. Um, and then, and, and then, uh, um, and then we, once we know that network architecture, we can run this recurrent uh, network and get a prediction. And what we see is that this tree RNN uh, compared to say trying to uh, force the data into like an image-like representation, uh, performed quite a bit better. This is like a rock curve that's presented in a slightly different way than normal, but up and to the right is better. So we see quite a bit of a performance gain. This is a logarithmic scale also. Um, and then also see uh, this neural network uh, used uh, you know uh, quite a few less parameters. So it had about 34,000 parameters instead of something like 1.5 million parameters for a, a model that did essentially you know only slightly better. Um, but this model also performs very well when you uh, modify the data a little bit. So it's it's quite robust to uh, domain at, domain shift. And uh, so this this kind of uh, result is something that kind of uh, supports the the claim by. Uh, Yashua Bingio earlier on about what if the what if the architecture is actually capturing the right causal structure. Um, so there's been some other work. Uh, th th what I just showed was a discriminative task where we're trying to do classification. There's also been some work to try to generate uh, the distribution of you know the try to make a generative model that you know produces data that looks like this. Um, and so here we all you really care about is producing the the data that's on the leaves of this tree. Um, but the generative model is actually, again, organized in this tree-like structure. And so you have a kind of autoregressive uh, model, but instead of it being a sequence, it's structured more like a tree. So you sort of decide, should you branch or not? And then you follow each branch and it, it may branch or not. Um, and, uh, and, and so this, this model ends up describing uh, the data quite well, which is nice. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about it is that the intermediate nodes uh, still have a physical interpretation. They still mean something similar to what our our actual physics simulator means. And here is a uh, um, a, a plot of some you know some some variable. It doesn't really matter. It has to do with the you know the energy associated to one of these particles. Um, and uh, but that's being generated by this. This is a you know this is a deep neural network. Um, so the you can look at the energy that's produced for one of these internal latent particles that you wouldn't actually get to observe in your detector, uh, and compare that to what you would have in a in a simulator written by a physicist, and you actually see that the distribution looks the same. So this is really interesting because you have a causal generative model that is a neural network. Uh, you're training it just by looking at the observed data. So it has this latent variable model, you know, uh, issue associated to it, um, and then the internal states along the way, the latent variables inside of the generative model are interpretable, and they even have the same distribution uh, as what you would see in a, in a, you know, a simulator written by a, you know, by hand by a physicist. So, so I think this is, you know, pretty pretty exciting work. Um, so one of the difficulties of this tree-based model is that as you as you move some particle, like this is a picture of these like particles hitting your detector. Um, so this is like the, these are essentially the spatial locations of you know, where it hit your detector and the size of the circle is like how much energy that particle had. Um, so you can think about, uh, you know, if you move one of these particles around, uh, the problem with the tree representation is that the tree will change discontinuously as you move the particles around. Um, and so, um, so you could try to get around that by instead thinking about all of the pairwise distances between these particles, um, and then encode that um, the you know the distance between some particle i and some particle i prime 
is, is represented as an adjacency matrix. That's this, this matrix here. Um, and that, uh, and what's, what's kind of cool about this adjacency matrix is you get to uh, say, what do you mean by distance? You know, is it, is it like a geometric distance or is it an angle? Or uh, in our case, we're going to use a notion of distance that uh, takes into account considerations from special relativity. And so when we so when we do something like this, we make this adjacency matrix where we get to inject our physics knowledge, um, and then we can use this adjacency matrix in the context of a graph neural network um, uh, to try to uh, to solve one of these tasks. So I really like this because once you sort of identify the adjacency matrix with this particular meaningful notion of like the distances between the particles you have two things you can do. One thing is you can import your physics knowledge and say, this is the graph. I'm going to freeze the graph uh, based on the physics that I know. <clears throat> or the other thing you could do is try to uh, learn the adjacency matrix and interpret it in, in the same way. And that allows you to sort of export uh, the physics knowledge uh, in some form, again, which you can interpret and then see if you can use this notion of distance for say, solving some other task. Um, and these kinds of ideas of using the, uh, you know, an adjacency matrix based on distance is also happening now in terms of protein folding. I'm sure many of you saw the news about AlphaFold2 and the success that they've, they've had uh, recently in protein folding. Um, so these are just some examples of some proteins and the uh, adjacency matrix that has to do with distances. Um, there was a, a very nice, uh, you know, well, I mean, this was the very, the kind of breakthrough news that they had uh, just a few weeks ago about uh, about how well this alpha fold is working but there's been a, a substantial improvement between the previous version of alpha fold and the newest version of alpha fold uh, called alpha fold 2 and it's not really clear yet exactly you know uh, what all is going on in alpha fold 2 they, there's no paper yet uh, but there was a very nice um, uh, a blog post that just came out yesterday, I think, uh, that was talking about AlphaFold2. And one of the things that's mentioned in the, you know, the material that we know about it is that they, they talk about uh, having a, uh, you know, a, a sort of 3D, you know, uh, a type of uh, equivariant neural network. And so that, that word equivariant is pointing again to the importance of symmetry. And so this whole um, uh, blog post is, is trying to uh, kind of, you know, shed light on what may be going on in terms of how AlphaFold2 is exploiting symmetry. Um, and uh, and so here it's mainly has to do with the fact that the, the protein is the same protein if you rotate the thing around in 3D or move it, you know, left and right. And so the question is, how do you build that kind of symmetry uh, into the neural network? Um, and if you can build that symmetry in there, you don't have to learn it. And so that can help quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> so there have been Similar types of work uh, about, uh, you know, here again with protein folding, uh, where you're trying to understand sort of the energy landscape of the different configurations of, of, a, of a molecule. And uh, here that there's a picture of two different configurations of, of, a, of a molecule. Um, and but the point here is that these are both kind of stable configurations. So you'd say they're both relatively low energy, stable configurations. So they would, if you if you got a, a molecule into the situation like it's a drug, it might be stable for some time. In terms of if you think of an energy-based model, that energy, um, the lower the energy, like the higher the probability it is to find yourself in that situation. You have a probability that looks like e to the minus energy. Um, and and so one of the difficulties is that you have. Uh, these two peaks. It's like a multimodal distribution. You have a peak over here for, that describes one set of configurations, and then you have a very different peak that in the, st in the space of configurations of the molecule is very far away, um, and again, is, uh, is, is pretty stable. And so trying to model, if you think of this as a probability distribution over the configurations, um, then uh, you know, trying to model this distribution is difficult. And so this is one of these places where normalizing flows uh, are, are being used. Um, and that is then speeding up the simulations of these types of, uh, of you know, molecular dynamic systems and things like that. So this is one uh, nice work uh, by Frank No and uh, 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 Jonas Kohler and company. Um, there has been other kind of related work in physics associated to this. Um, I've been doing some stuff that has to do with the uh, lattice field theory, where now you're actually trying to describe um, in, in you know, space-time, so it's like a four-dimensional grid, 
uh, you're trying to describe uh, the configurations of some quantum mechanical field uh, that lives in you know in space and time. And so this is a like a video that you see um, of time rolling out of some quantum mechanical field fluctuating. Um, and and this is just for one example. Like the so this 40 40 movie you can think of as one uh, you know one uh, example of data uh, for this four dimensional box. And what we would really like to be able to do is not uh, think about the movie so much, but think about the distribution over these four dimensional objects. Um, and that's what's, uh, if you've ever heard of it in, in, uh, in, in physics, there's this idea of the path integral that sort of sums overall, like when you think of a particle, it can take any possible path to get from one place to the other, and they, they interfere with each other quantum mechanically, and all these kinds of crazy things happen. And so this is what we would like to try to understand and we'd like to be able to see if we can use machine learning to, uh, to help us do that. Um, and so one of the, the difficulties in this situation, uh, well, so okay, before I get to that, uh, so if you think of this distribution of over these paths, what we can use is something like a, a normalizing flow-based model to try to describe that distribution. And we can train that either by using maximum likelihood type approaches or by using a reverse KL that looks something more like a, like how you would train a variational autoencoder. You have something like the elbow, um, which for physicists is related to, you know, what you would call the, like the variational free energy. So you try to you know, minimize this, uh, that, this elbow um, and you have a flow type of model that with, with a known uh, density in the end. And if you can do that, then you can, you can uh, you know, sample these configurations much more efficiently. Um, so one of the difficulties in the situation is that the data is, is, is weird. It's not like an image where you go to some pixel and you have like a, a real number that tells you like the, the gray scale or three, three real numbers that tell you the red, green, and blue colors. Instead, you have data that's, uh, that uh, is related to symmetry groups that you find in particle physics. And so in particular, the data might look like a, a, a matrix that's like a, a, a unitary matrix. And so the data is you know, highly structured. And we also in physics have these, these different kinds of symmetries that happen in particle physics. So we know that in the, the very high dimensional space of the data, that there is some directions, you know, several of the directions, the distribution should be totally flat because the energy doesn't, or, uh, doesn't change at all. While uh, if we just use a normal neural network, like a flow, it will try to model some kind of, comp it won't know that that symmetry exists and it'll model some kind of complicated distribution. So we did some work to see if we could uh, somehow enforce the symmetry in the flows. And that was difficult, but we were able to pull it off. Um, and, uh, and, the, uh, and once we were able to do that, then this whole approach uh, to trying to understand and, and model these types of uh, you know, systems uh, that you find in, you know, in, in theoretical particle physics finally started to work. Um, and so before that, before we enforced the symmetry, basically it didn't work at all. Um, and so now that it's working, we're <coughs> making quite a bit of progress and, uh, and trying to extend that to some of the more elaborate symmetries that you, you find in particle physics. And so I'm not going to go through these things, but you see all of this beautiful, uh, you know, uh, group theory that's found in particle physics and uh, things like Lie groups and stuff like that. So this was worked together a group at MIT and DeepMind. Um, and, uh, and it's been a, a lot of fun to try to figure out how to enforce these like, you know, kind of strange symmetries in, in a neural network. Okay, so, um, so in the talk so far, I basically hit on, uh, you know, the I issues with graph neural networks, uh, inductive bias, uh, symmetries, causality, um, and, I, and I talked about various science applications. Um, with time so far, I didn't get to say much about simulation-based inference, which is which I planned on talking about. I did hit on deep generative models some. Um, I, I, I wanted to say more about this com uh, combination of simulation-based inference and deep generative models, but because of time, I will, uh, I will uh, not really get to it. I, I will post the slides online. Um, I'll just kind of flip through them so you can get a feel for what, what, what I would have uh, shown you. Um, but the, the connection here was going to be that these simulators, in addition to generating a bunch of synthetic data, um, they are typically what are called implicit models, meaning that they, you can generate data from them, but they don't have a tractable likelihood function. Uh, and so uh, there's this connection, for instance, there was an ICML workshop in 2017 talking about things like generative adversarial networks, 
variational autoencoders and these types of deep generative models that also don't have a tractable likelihood. Um, and so they're called implicit models. Um, and and this, this workshop was making the connection between these kind of, uh, you know, these, you know, these common deep generative models and real world simulators. Uh, so for instance, the ones used in particle physics uh, and, and trying to bring together the, the connection there uh, of, of the different techniques that are being used. So, um, so I, I showed you this kind of example before from particle physics. Um, and uh, I have some nice examples, you know, kind of more uh, simple examples of like uh, trying to simulate, a, a, you know, a sort of more simple system like this and to try to explain why it is that the, the likelihood is intractable. And it's basically because it's a latent variable model and you need to integrate over the latent state and that typically is, is intractable. Um, and so then, uh, um, so I'll just point to the fact that we wrote recently a review article talking about new approaches for trying to do inference when you have a simulator uh, that has one of these intractable likelihoods. And so this, this is this area of simulation-based inference. And the traditional methods that have been used uh, kind of only work when the simulator is not too expensive or the dimensionality of the quantity that you're trying to infer is not too high and the dimensionality of the data is not too high. But what's happening now with uh, some of these deep generative models is that it's allowing us to you know, go with machine learning and model like much uh, more complicated data. Uh, and there are some other approaches that have to do with uh, automatic differentiation and probabilistic programming that are allowing the, us to kind of uh, work with more uh, complicated simulators or more expensive simulators. And then there's ideas from active learning that allow us to use the simulators much more efficiently. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's kind of a, an overview of, uh, of different, uh, uh, of different uh, approaches there. I'm not going to be able to go through that now. Um, um, I have some, you know, some fun examples there, but I unfortunately I'm going to skip them. Um, let me just find, I will kind of flip through this. This was one example that I was going to highlight that had to do with dark matter. Uh, so these blue clumps are dark matter around a, a, a galaxy. Um, and and the, the, if you have, a, if this is a galaxy with a bunch of dark matter in it, and these are the little clumps of, of dark matter around it, you can't see the dark matter directly. But if there is a, another galaxy far away that's directly behind it, its image will be bent because of uh, the way that uh, gravity bends space and time. Um, and that gives you these kind of crazy images where the, the image of the background galaxy is warped and, and lensed by uh, this foreground galaxy. And so you can then look for small deviations in this image and try to uh, extract if you, you know, what's going on with the dark matter. Um, and there are various kinds of satellites out there that are going to be collecting a lot of images like this. Um, and so we, we worked on an inference pipeline that uh, where we have a simulator in one direction that's describing simulating these kinds of images. And then we use a, a neural network uh, that, uh, that tries to connect this image to the, uh, the, the parameters of the simulator that we're trying to infer. Um, and uh, and we, uh, we, we use these ideas from simulation-based inference. Uh, our, our simulator sort of randomly drops little you know, hunks of dark matter around. The number of dark matter halos is variable. So the latent, the latent space is actually doesn't even have a fixed dimensionality. So you can't run traditional Markov chain Monte Carlo on this. Um, and, uh, and we include all of these kinds of uh, experimental effects with the optics and you know, Poisson fluctuations of the photons hitting your detector. Um, and then we try to infer this whole thing and, I, and we end up with a pipeline that as images roll in, we're able to do, this is the, the two parameters that we're trying to infer. And this is a Bayesian posterior and you see the posterior starting to concentrate around the true value that was used for this uh, synthetic data. Um, and so you, you're able to use here deep learning uh, to uh, carry out a very, very difficult uh, inference task, which is aimed at like a really interesting uh, question about what's going on with dark matter. Um, so I will end with that um, and uh, conclude by just saying that, uh, uh, you know, I think the overarching message here is that the, the insight of the data generating process informs the inductive bias of the architecture. Um, and that when we start thinking about some of the really difficult questions for trying to say automate, you know, science or trying to think about uh, artificial intelligence uh, more generally, you know, one of the difficulties we have has to do with hypothesis generation um, and uh, kind of an open world of experimental design. I mean, like what kinds of 
you know, if you're a child playing, you know, what, what should you uh, play with next, you know, to try to learn something more about the world. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, applying machine learning in the context of the physical sciences is a really good way to try to make progress and understand which of these approaches is working well. Um, and our ability to figure out how to exploit what we know about a, a system and the underlying mechanistic model and how to incorporate that into something like deep learning is improving. And, uh, and, and we're also getting better at sort of being able to uh, inject and extract knowledge from, uh, from these deep learning systems. And I think that's really exciting. So I will end with that. And I uh, hope uh, that was enjoyable. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. We got so many questions that uh, I think you really got uh, our audience uh, interested in your talk. Uh, unfortunately, we will uh, we are running out of time now, so I will ask you just one question: uh, Are the graphs uh, for those simulation dense? For example, in the water simulation, uh, is there a direct edge between each particle? If so, how to train and evaluate uh, such big graphs efficiently? Right. So uh, that's a good question. So I think that uh, in some of the you know first work that we did like this, that the, the graphs were uh, were often fully connected. Um, but in the the models here, you see, for instance, for the chain like structure, um, they're not fully connected. They kind of know that the links are sort of only talk to their their neighbors. Um, and this type of model, uh, I, I'm if I remember correctly, they do have a technique for being able to uh, make the graph be sparse. And uh, there's also some work of taking advantage of uh, languages like haiku, if you're familiar with it, instead that are like particularly aimed at dealing with these sparse data structures. Um, so it's a very good question. Um, and trying to figure out how to make the graphs be sparse on their own, where you don't do that by hand, is definitely like one of the important topics of this research. Perfect, thank you. So ooh, maybe one more question. You showed that modeling physics, modeling in physics, uh, sorry, you showed that modeling physics knowledge requires new kinds of parametrization and structures of neural networks. That's exciting. Do you know examples of applying physics related machine learning find findings to other fields? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think, it yeah, there's there's a lot going on there. I think that uh, uh, I mean, in some sense, it's hard to say. There's such a rich interaction between physics and machine learning. You know, many of the techniques, if you just think about something like variational inference, it's very very general and it's applied all over the place. But the history of variational inference comes, you know, largely from statistical physics. Um, and uh, but what's interesting is those ideas started and then it was taken over essentially by statisticians and then by the kind of probabilistic machine learning community and now it's coming back to physics again <laughs> so that so you have kind of this nice cycle of, of, of interactions but uh, I think there are many 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 examples and uh, probably have to take uh, take too long to list them <laughs> so maybe you will stay with us and uh, and to enjoy the conference and maybe answer questions in the backstage as well yeah very much uh, for for your talk and a uh, short announcement for for our participants and now we have a break and so we invite you for the networking sessions and the expo zone uh, we are meeting at uh, half uh, half past three uh, um, for and the fireside chat thank you kyle again and hope you enjoy uh, the conference Great, thank you. Bye-bye.